So hello again and welcome to The Cauldron with Marion, Claire, myself and Lisa. And it's been a very exciting week this week, interesting week perhaps, um, in particular with the programme for government where Nicola Sturgeon confirmed that her intention to destroy the rights of women in Scotland. And um, so that's obviously uh, something that we're going to have to deal with over the next weeks and months. But Nicola Sturgeon can be assured she won't be doing this in the darkness. This will be done in the light, the full glare of publicity. And we'll make sure everybody knows her intentions, her queer theory ideology that she intends to impose on Scotland's women and children. So Marion, on that note, let's go over to Marion Calder and see how her week has been. Well, I'm still getting over from uh, the busy week of last week, and as you can tell by my throat, my, my voice hasn't really quite come back, but I'll do my best. Apologies if uh, my voice starts breaking. Um, yes, as uh, Denise, as you just said, uh, not unexpected doing when uh, for starting to announce that uh, they're actually going to be moving through the reform of the GRA. Uh, what this bill will look like, well, we've got the rough idea, it's about kind of self-ID, but we don't know what the detail is as yet. So we're going to have to wait and see on that one. But basically, for anyone that's not aware of this, this is uh, the ability for anyone, male or female, to uh, be able to change their birth certificate just by on their say so. I mean, just rock up, make a pledge saying, I am the opposite sex, albeit they use the word gender. And uh, that's it. Um, and then they'll be governed by and have all the, the protections under under that. So as much as people say, oh, this is just a kind of small minor admin role. Um, since when has it ever been allowed to change your kind of birth certificate a small minor role? Tell me anyone else who's allowed to do this. It's a factual record. So there's a lot to be discussed. And as Denise was saying there, that this will be done under the full light and, and women will be paying attention this time around. And I should really look forward to actually having um, some quite um, serious discussions. I've been watching the committee's uh, progress with the bill in detail. And, uh, and well, it's gonna be a lot of campaigning, um, street campaigns, um, more protests. So I need to get my voice back for that. And uh, yeah, the fight goes on. So it wasn't unexpected, we did expect it, but I have to say it's still very disappointing to, to have your first minister who's um, who is not feminist or fingertips doing it at all, um, come out and actually uh, come out with a piece of legislation that uh, takes away, again, rights for women. I mean, I don't know what the heck it is with this kind of uh, the SNP that refused to actually protect women's rights. They missed out on the, the hate crime. We had to argue over the kind of forensic bill, the six words campaign. Now they seem to be absolutely hell bent on actually removing women's rights something that we had to campaign really hard for. So, and just to say, can't change sex. Gender and sex, not the same thing. So I'll be printing a lot of these out, I think. So that was a, a leftover from last week's campaign. So that, that's pretty much, uh, oh, almost forgot. Um, and also an interesting thing today was um, Murder Fraser from the Conservative Party. Um, and Chambers had uh, kind of raised the issue about how he had attended and come out last at last week's demonstration and how it was well attended and one of the largest that he'd ever seen. And halfway through him kind of just speaking about the subject matter, um, the First Minister apparently interjected with, uh, what was it, shame on you? Of which was just absolutely incredible to actually call across the chambers, shame on you for a kind of an individual standing up who at least had the decency to come out, as, as did other members of the Conservative Party, and actually speak to women. So I don't, I'd love to actually know what who was the shame on. Was it shame on Murder Fraser for raising the subject matter? Was it shame on us that we were all out? Women were outside, can't you mean? having a demonstration, a peaceful demonstration, but she didn't come out and speak to us. So I think I know who the shame is and it's certainly not a murder and it's certainly not on us. So shame on you, Nicola. So, yeah. That's me. Her worldview is that the women outside protesting their rights and demanding to keep their rights 
keep their protections and keep the protections for their children and girls, that's the people that should be ashamed? Or should it be the MSPs <laughs> cowering in the chamber and too frightened to come out to actually have a reasoned discussion with us because they know that they can't win their arguments. Do they all take to do, do you mean because I mean it's a bit we'll be boiling down to do they actually think that people can change sex? Do you mean generally have they are they actually kind of throwing away all of their kind of learning expertise to actually think that, that you magically can transform. I, I don't know, but I mean, the, the, they will be asked about this. So, um, and, and I know they'll be absolutely kind of, uh, they'll be a bit worried, but that will be a question, you know, what is a woman, can you change sex? And uh, it's a really simple question. Yeah, well, we already know that our health secretary doesn't know how many sexes there are. So on that nice note, we'll go on to find out from Claire how her week has been. <laughs> Good evening everyone again. Um, so I am not um, ashamed of my views. I'm not ashamed of trying to protect women and especially children from this ideology. Um, I read what Mary Hunter wrote in the Times um, and I, I'm flabbergasted actually that she cannot see that this is an issue for women, this is an issue for children. Um, what is self-ID if it is not an opportunity for certain men uh, with certain fetishes and certain persuasions to easily um, gain access to vulnerable people with impunity? You know, there's no, they don't have to, they can't even be challenged, they can't be asked their sex, they can't, nothing can happen to these men. Um, if you speak to any specialist working with sex offenders, they will all tell you these men will do anything, they will say anything to gain access to these people, to, to children if they're paedophiles, women if they are misogynistic, um, autogynophiles for example, and they, you know, they're, they're a huge danger to women and this opens the door for all of that and I think if yeah, so if Mary Hunter is speaking on behalf of the SNP and is presumably speaking on behalf of Nicola Sturgeon and her government, um, and she has no idea about these um, problems that occur now for women, why did none of them come out to speak to us? You know, why do they have all these opinions about us, yet none of them will engage? Um, we're, we're silenced to every opportunity. Parents don't know this is happening to their children. Parents don't know that queer theory is now being normalised in school. Um, and with the SNP policies where children are now given education earlier and earlier so that, you know, mothers can go back to work, etc. That's just capturing children earlier and earlier in their life so that they then are unquestioning about this stuff. You know, parents must ask the question, you know, what is a woman? Um, do you believe there are two sexes or do you believe in queer theory? What is queer theory? Um, I actually wrote something down about that. And that is um, queer theory basically challenges the idea that heterosexuality is normal. And it's basically saying um, it's sexualizing children really at a very early age to accept everything. Now to me, heterosexuality, uh, being gay, uh, being a lesbian and bisexual, those are kind of standard um, sexual practices, I would say. But the transgender is not, you know, Mary herself um, admits that they make up 0.5% of the population. So why are we introducing policies to give such a tiny minority such power. Why are we all having to accommodate this? Women's rights are being thrown out of the window to accommodate this. Why is that? You know, the, they say the SNP claim that the public um, endorse gender recognition. I, I would actually challenge that very, very robustly and say, 
they don't actually understand what what that means you know they don't understand that I've got a fantastic um post that I read and I've just printed it out because I thought I must read it but it says it means men claiming to be women in order to express their paraphilia in public transgressing all of women's boundaries against their consent in public toilets changing rooms hospital wards rape crisis centers domestic violence, refugees, prisons, everywhere, okay? Women will have no dignity left, no privacy left. Now, is that what you want for your children going forward? Because it's not what I want, not at all. I've got some other stuff to say, but I'll let someone else speak for a minute. So I think, Lisa, you have been uh, looking into the materials for schools, haven't you, this week? So what did you find out? Hi, Denise. So, yeah, this week I've been looking at the, I'll get the name of it, the RSHP um, for the school's curriculum, the slides they show. I've been reading through the literature and I've been looking at the slides and the slides deeply concern me. I've been looking at the level two slides, which are for 10 to 12 year olds. And... I'm all for children having to know names of their body parts and things like that. I think it's educational. I think they need to know their bodies and we should tell them, obviously people shouldn't touch them in places because it's inappropriate. But these slides say that sex should feel nice. Adults learn what they do and don't like. Um, my favorite one is um, when a woman feels like having sex with her partner, her vulva, might, or her vulva and her vagina, sorry, might feel tingly and wet or slippery to touch. For me, there's there's so much more. Um, if a man and a woman are having sex, they should both want to do it, which is fair enough, obviously consent. And um, the man can put his penis inside the woman's vagina and gently move his penis in and out. And this should feel nice for both. Now, I'm sorry, if you're telling 10 and 12 year olds, anybody in that age range, that something should feel nice, they're gonna want to try it. They're, they're telling them how to masturbate safely. Why are you telling my 10 year old son how to masturbate? That's not on. Um, I mean, th there's so much more as well. I was looking at the, they've got a section on stereotypes. Now I'll put the link in the description. Um, they've got a section on stereotypes and they're saying, you know, you should not be categorized. So if a girl wants to play football and like play with cars and do like boy stuff, that's okay. You can be a girl that doesn't fit into the, the gender norms. Boys can, you know, play with dolls, et cetera. And that's fine. We shouldn't stereotype you. There's no such thing as stereotypes. We shouldn't be labeling children. And then you move on to the next set of slides, which is transgender children. And how if you don't fit into these stereotypes, you might be transgender. So we're contradicting our children. We're sexualizing our children. We're telling them one thing. And then in the next breath, we're telling them something completely different. This, this isn't right. But it's already enforced a stereotype by saying playing football is a boy's task, sport. So even in them saying, you know, don't fall, fall into stereotypes, they've actually just reinforced the stereotypes. Another part, obviously, on this website I've looking at, I was looking at, it passes you on to another website, which also goes on to explain gender identity. And it says that, you know, we're on a spectrum. So you've got a man here and a woman here. And then you've got like this little guy in the middle who's genderqueer, androgynous and bigendered. And we're teaching our children, you can be anywhere from a boy to a girl and anywhere in between, you can be whatever you want. And you don't even have to tell your parents. Yay. Okay. So um, I also hear that you may have had another chat with one of the SMP people, Lisa. Somebody we have already mentioned this show. <laughs> yes, so today I have been messaging Mary Hunter on Twitter. So I'd read her Times article as well and I'd asked for a little bit of clarification on the Times article. I had asked for her to tell me what a woman was and how she intends to protect women. To which she told me to go and read her article, which I reread it because I thought maybe I've just missed something in it. Um, so I reread it and I told her I've reread it. Um, could you explain to me, you know, what is a woman? I have said to Mary, um, you know, how, if you can't define a woman, how do you plan on putting these protective provisions in place for women? To which she told me to read her article again, which I did. And I just said to her, could you at least quote on here so I know what you're referring to? In the end, I just said to her, Mary, could you define a woman for me? What is a woman? To which she went silent on me. So that is uh, Graham Day, who does not know what a woman is, 
Karen Adam, who blocked me uh, last week, and now Mary Hunter does not know what a woman is, apparently. I'm pretty sure they know what a woman is, but they're just not allowed to tell you, because otherwise, if they did, Nicola Sturgeon would be shouting shame on you at them. <laughs> So from, for me, I'm just going to go with good news this week. Police and crime commissioners are in England. We don't have them in Scotland, which is a real pity because actually we should, because our Police Scotland could do with oversight. Because at the moment, Police Scotland seem to be far too captured by the gender ideology. And that's really taken one side in the debate. So women have lost confidence in the police. They believe that we can easily be criminalized. Police have visited women for writing chalk slogans, which is just simply um, women's rights or human rights. And one woman was threatened with breach of the peace that she would be charged. We know that Marion Miller is currently being charged. Um, also, the, the police have sticker crime, where stickers that say women equals ad, adult human female are a crime, and police put on Twitter, we found these homophobic stickers. <laughs> so it would be a really good idea if we had police and crime commissioners to make sure that the police treated everyone the same and didn't take sides in this debate. So in England, they have the, the police and crime commissioners, and one of them, Lisa Townsend, said Stonewall had become a well-funded lobby group for a dangerous ideology that threatens the safety of our women and girls. Now, this is very true. That statement I totally believe in, that the gender ideology that's imposed on Scotland by Stonewall via the Scottish government is dangerous to the safety of women and girls. And she has been backed up by several other police and crime commissioners. Tim Passmore says, I think Lisa Townsend is absolutely correct with her desire to stop funding Stonewall. It's changed from an organisation that was promoting the rights of gay people, but it's now become too confrontational in its approach. David Sidberg from Dorset, the police and crime commissioner, she said he says the police should uphold the law without fear or favour, and they were for should not subscribe or support lobby groups with agendas. And that's what we have in Scotland. We have a lobby group with agenda, which is hell bent on removing sex based rights from women. So this is a, quite a good thing in in England that their police and crime commissioners are supporting women, and you can see from these quotes that they're all, they obviously understand what our issues are. So here's one. The issue here is the quite understandable concerns of women in areas such as refuges, prisons, and with regard to offences of sexual assault and rape. So these people get it. So why don't we have people in Scotland that get it? Why are we left without getting support? from people that should be supporting us. Maybe we do need police and crime commissioners in Scotland. And then the other bit of good news, as well as police and crime commissioners in England seem to have Stonewall's number and are determined to protect women and girls, which is very good. And I would hope that Police Scotland would follow suit one day. <laughs> The other bit of good news is a conference, ALBA conference, in this weekend. So ALBA is the party run by Alex Almond, and it supports independence for Scotland, and it also supports the rights, very, very strong support of the rights of women and girls. And there's, there's a resolution going to the conference, which is from my branch, Dundee, and this resolution should, if passed, enshrine as ALBA policy women's sex-based rights, our rights to organise, our rights to single-sex spaces and services, our rights to sport, our rights to talk without abuse and without being turned into a criminal for our beliefs. But also that um, conference, part of that resolution at the conference is talking about the needs of transgender 
Now, there's a group of transgender people, transsexuals, whose voices are just ignored in this debate. They're not getting listened to. In the main, they support women and they will, they believe that, of course, we don't know, we can't talk for all of them because nobody really asks them and there's no polls of them. But the ones I have talked to, they need clinical interventions they want a clinical process because if we bring in self-id the person is just saying right i'm transgender and they get okay you are you're a woman now congratulations whereas with this clinical process they need to talk to a cl clinician and this is a big benefit to the trans person because most will not need surgery or medication most will either grow out of it or they will find out there's actually something else that's bothering them, that's underlying their problem. And without a clinician, a clinical aspect to transition, then they'll never find this out. So we're not doing transsexuals a favour here by, or transgender people a favour here by not giving them clinical help because we're not finding out the root cause. And some of them may go on to transition, then detransition. Some of them go on a lifetime of medication that's unnecessary. So taking away the clinical part of this is a very big mistake. The other thing about the clinical part that gives us women is gatekeeping. So it gives us, the rest of us, some reassurance. We're reassured that it's not a man with a sexual fetish. We're reassured it's not a voyeur or a person, a flasher, you know, an exhibitionist. We can be reassured it's not just a predator looking to get access to women and children. And we can be reassured that it's not just men who perhaps are, for example, criminals that just want to get into women's prisons because they, they would judge that easier. Because if you were a criminal, of course you'd want to go to a women's prison. Why wouldn't you? So the important, that's the important thing about the clinical step. So GRA, we should maintain the clinical part. And I think transsexuals whose voices have basically been ignored would agree with that because they have their own journeys. They have their own medical needs. There's not so too much similarity between a transsexual and Eddie Izzard, who's got a girl brain uh, and a cross-dresser. <laughs> So I think we should, we need to listen to transsexuals more. And then the other group that I think are very much harmed by this debate, and I mean, it's, it was always obviously going to, to come to this, it was obviously going to be contentious, and the people caught in the middle are the transgender children, um, young people, who believe that us, the women, hate them. And they, they get told that we hate them, they get told we're bigots, they get told we're transphobes, and we don't. So we don't at all, it's quite the opposite. We want to protect them. That's what we want to do, we want to protect them. So the ALBA policy in this resolution is to have a citizens assembly to discuss these issues, to have transsexual voices represented, to have young people's voices and to understand the issues in a, in a non-contentious way and find solutions that we can all agree with without having this. But unfortunately, <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon, that's not her way of doing things. Her way is to impose queer ideology on Scotland and take away and destroy women's rights. But obviously, she's in for a big fight because our foremothers fought for our rights and we've enjoyed these rights, these self-based rights, and we cannot take those rights away from our daughters and granddaughters. We can't let it be taken away. So this is a battle that we are going to win. So... Um, I think well, you did a quite good summary there, kind of uh, Denise, about the challenges about what we what we're kind of facing here. Um, I mean, it, it's just I, I still I'm just struggling kind of this week to kind of wonder how we got to this place. Do you know I mean, as in Scotland, 
where, when it became that we suddenly became this wonderful progressive society of where that we didn't actually have to separate by sex anymore. I didn't mean, I must have missed this. <laughs> so I just find it just absolutely, absolutely incredible. And when you speak to kind of uh, individuals, women, males, like the guy at the chip shop about what's going on, uh, and, they're, and they're just flabbergasted. They're going, no, no one thinks that, do they? But why? And uh, this idea that this kind of, uh, um, we're widening up what was like this 0.5%, if not that, to be far larger. I mean, anyone can change their, their sex, the breast of it using this process. But also it gives actually higher uh, rights, which most of them are not really aware of. And this was kind of raised at a meeting that Lisa and I were at um, a few weeks ago in Dundee by a transsexual that was actually in the meeting. And so that kind of pointed out that uh, you have a higher level of security if you have a GRC, which um, individual did have. So for, they have the same level as MSPs, MPs, and those are in the kind of witness protection program. So they actually have, so all this aspect is just, it's crazy. I mean, so they, I mean, the, the transsexuals was explaining about it, it was, they were having problems accessing um, information on their own pension plan because of the sheer the, the security that they have to go through in different departments. So it's, there's a, a lot of stuff to this that needs to be kind of highlighted that it's, it's removing kind of rights away from women, but also actually giving an extension of rights um, to a separate group that no other group in society has. So, yeah, crazy. That's a good for So Mary Hunter actually starts her piece in the Times. Um, she actually starts it by saying that gender recognition has become hugely controversial in Scotland. Um, so she completely recognises and accepts that there is an issue. So they need to start um, engaging with for like four women, Scotland, etc., and women to discuss this. And if not 0.5% of the population, a tiny fraction of, um, of a percentage, sorry, of population um, identifies as trans, why is it that the needs of that minority are just dictating healthcare for the majority. You know, I, I just don't really, I don't really understand why, why that is. Why are all these laws changing to accommodate such a tiny minority? Why are we, you know, why are we sort of gaslighting children at school into thinking that actually boys liking girls and girls liking boys is somehow abnormal? You know, that's completely normal. What's not normal is to be transgender. Um, I'm not saying that people should not be free to express themselves as adults, but we should be very, very careful about what we are doing to children. Um, I actually had an interesting conversation with someone. It was, um, it was my aunt and she's quite elderly. She's in her 80s, but she's quite progressive. Um, and she'd been chatting to one of her um, friends and about this because obviously she's outraged as well. Um, and her friend talked about, she said, oh, yeah, my um, grandchildren know about this. And she said, and they think it's a load of rubbish. Now they're teenagers. So we need to be asking ourselves now, if teenagers are thinking that, what are the government going to go for next? They're going to go for the young children. So your children that are being carted off to nurseries and to, you know, to the, well, to school for the first time, please think about what they're being taught in school. Please ask questions. The government doesn't want parents to know what's going on because they can't, they can't answer these questions. They have no excuse for these policies and they need to start providing reasons about why this is happening. And I've got a little bit of a funny thing to end on. I read this um, <laughs> comment on Twitter and it made me laugh for quite a while, but I remember ages ago, I read a comment from a trans identified male who'd gone for the COVID vaccination and he'd taken to Twitter after it because the person giving the um, jab had asked him if he was pregnant and 
I mean, this basically made this person's life, you know, I mean, they, they were like on cloud nine because they'd been asked that question. It was like complete validation. Anyway, and I didn't think much more of it. Someone at the time said, well, they ask everyone that, you know, and so kind of bursting his bubble. And I thought, oh, you know, goodness. But yesterday I read a comment from a woman who said that her 65 year old father had gone for his COVID um, vaccination and someone actually asked him if he was pregnant for God's sake. And the thing that was the funniest thing was that he actually said, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is happening? Why are we asking 65 year old Obviously, male people, if they are pregnant, get a grip. I think it's all part of science denial there, Claire. It's not <laughs> reality denial. <laughs> um, I just wanted to touch on the fact that people are being silenced throughout all of our society, you know, academics. You know, if the SNP had come to um, the demo, they would have heard from women who talk about people stuck in prisons, the academics whose, you know, academic freedoms are, are being um, affected by all of this as well. Um, and then the very important um, social workers. Now, Sonia Appleby um, recently, well, just the other day, won her case, and I think she won £20,000 for the damage to her professional reputation and the attempts to silence her as she valiantly tried to help children with dysphoria. You know, she was basically told to, to shut up um, and she didn't. And she was taken to court. Um, and the result is that she won, she actually did win her case. But one thing I'll leave you with is the psychologist at the Tavistock um, Centre where this controversy, another controversy, contra controversy sorry, um, after Kira Bell, the psychologist actually joked to say there would be no gay kids left. That is a sobering thought. And I think that is actually, we're seeing that happening now in schools. Um, there will be no gay children left if we let this carry on. And it really must be stopped. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on um, what you and Marion said about obviously the medicalization process being like kicked off sort of thing so for me I agree that the medicalization thing should be there because for some people this is just a mental health disorder they are just trying to fit in they're trying to fit in with the norms their friends or they've just got it in their head that they're just not normal maybe they're autistic maybe you know they've got Asperger's it could be a number of reasons so I think the medicalization part having to speak to a counsellor and having to really get to the root cause of what's causing these issues in themselves I think that's really important because I think if that's there we'll probably find a majority of these children they're not transgender they're just going through puberty they're a bit lost or maybe they just want a bit of attention or potentially they do have other underlying issues that are not gender related so I think removing that is a bad thing. I, I completely agree and you're right because Denise mentioned last week um, nine out of ten children with dysphoria the actual treatment for that is puberty you know, and by rushing to you know, medicalise it all, socially transition, medicalise it all, you are denying these children the chance of a normal life and a, a fulfilling sex life, for God's sake. They, everyone deserves that. One more final point to make. Mary Hunter, could you please get back to me and tell me what a woman is? Because I am waiting <laughs> in suspense for that. <laughs> So that's all for this week. So join us next week when we'll have more talk about what's been happening to women's rights in Scotland.